All right, I want to begin as ever by thanking Marcus Smith and the Thinking Aloud team, uh, letting us interview uh, a guest for both Thinking Aloud and for our Humanity Center website. Um, our guest today is Christopher Newfield, uh, who is a professor of, of literature and American studies at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, he's taking time out of a very busy schedule. He's in demand on the, on the speaker circuit uh, to visit us at BYU as a featured guest at our uh, Humanities Center annual symposium, uh, which this year is on innovation and the future of the humanities. This is a subject about which uh, Professor Newfield is a real expert. And I guess I'd begin by asking you how you became an expert on the subject. I should specify for our audience, just because you work at a university does not mean you're an expert <laughs> on the university, but you are. How'd that happen? Well, I was uh, actually amazed by the cuts, the budget cuts that we kept getting when I was an assistant professor. So that, that's what really got me into it. It was kind of a, an act of self-defense. Mm -hmm. So one thing led to another. I started to look at spreadsheets, trying to find out where the money went. Um, and I just, I'm not math phobic. You know, I was a science major <laughs> as yeah. an undergrad. Okay. And I, you know, I have a kind of, I really like columns of numbers that, you know, that tell mm -hmm. stories. And so I, I ended up doing a lot of work uh, in the 90s on kind of the management side of universities, what the management theory is or lack thereof. Right. And then in the 2000s, I uh, became active in the Academic Senate, uh, ended up getting mentored into the mysterious budget arts of my campus, and then ended <laughs> up chairing the Planning and Budget Committee uh, at, at my campus and system-wide, which gave me access to a lot of data I wouldn't have had otherwise. So okay. it was just kind of an incremental practical activity as well as an intellectual one. Okay, right. Um, that's interesting. The intellectual activity has been very obvious. You've written multiple books on the subject of the mm -hmm. university. I want to begin by asking you about one of them. Uh, 2003, you published a book called Ivy and Industry, uh, which tells, I think, a very nuanced story about the relationship between universities and corporations or business communities uh, from about around 1880 to around 1980. Uh, and the nuance, I think, is interesting in that, in that book. What was the kind of story you were hoping to tell about that relationship? Well, that basically universities and business have always have grown up together. I mean, there's a church history with colleges, but the research university has never been other to the American business system. Right. So I, I partly wanted to defuse a, a kind of a, just a binary opposition understanding of that and get people to think more interactively about the transactions that really that happen every day and this is there's a subset of that too which is for people in the humanities we don't really understand the extent to which the stem field science technology uh, engineering and, and mathematics are involved in business transactions with businesses large and small on a, on a more or less daily basis around contracted research on uh, intellectual property transfer, that kind of thing. So I wanted to bring my own colleagues more into the larger university world of finance, really, is, is what it is. Yeah, good. And so that's, that was part of it. But the other thing that I wanted to emphasize, which is as sort of more interesting to me, was the need for, the, uh, for separation and equality. In other words, for the university to be intellectually autonomous, to pursue its own goals, to um, work out its own craft methods and its own relationships with its primary constituency, which is students, independently of the forces that are always pushing you know, American capitalism in one direction or another. Uh, I don't think we can really do our intellectual jobs or our teaching jobs or our research jobs if we're too tied to market requirements. And so I wanted to give us, to in, make us understand the substructure so that we could have more independence and sort of in the superstructure of the, of the university itself. And then I also wanted to create a way of thinking about this historically so that everybody in the university could see where we'd been and use, you know, the lessons of the past to understand how we might collaboratively redesign universities that would work better in the future. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, it's an interesting history. And you talk about the independence, uh, the desired independence between, you know, these different spheres, the university sphere and the business sphere, and of course there are intersections. There are some strange parallelisms in a way between these two. I, I'm thinking here about a point in the book where you describe uh, what you call corporate humanism. Mm -hmm. And if I could just quote a bit from that book, you, you mentioned that that idea was built around three claims. First, 
that people naturally prefer to do good work rather than sloppy or minimal work. Second, that managers should seek positive work experience as much as they seek production efficiency. And third, that positive work experience and production efficiency are increased by significant self-management by employees. Now, these claims concerning the pride in hard work and emphasis on positive experience uh, and the privilege accorded to personal agency sound like the kinds of ideals that humanities disciplines <laughs> want to inculcate. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the important differences, or are there any at that level? Well, the big difference is um, the bottom line requirement in, in business so that you can't do human development, empowerment, and, and craft articulation or craft perfectionism in a, in a business sense in the same way that you can do it in a university. You can't be as experimental. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated situation. And I wrote this book, or it started that book anyway, in the 90s when I was working on management theory mm -hmm. as partly for the university pro project, but partly because I, you know, I'm an American studies person and I was amazed that so few people in my field were interested in corporate culture as a centerpiece of American culture. I mean, it's one of the most business-focused um, cultures that I've ever visited, and so it seemed like it was kind of a, a gap in our uh, academic coverage. So I began to read people like Tom Peters. Uh, there's a range of folks, and you know, Tom Peters was the author of In Search of Excellence, which was a book that in the early 80s got Americans to think that actually maybe not everything was terrible about their business system. But what he really he emphasized there was empowerment and the value that essentially liberated employees or what he called later on liberation management would bring to an enterprise by freeing up the creativity that individual people would have if they weren't being essentially ordered around. And this was certainly my experience. It's experience of myself, of my students, of my friends. You know, the, the really creative moments are ones that are unplanned, that are unmanaged. So my interest is, well, how can you have organization that's coherent without the kind of top-down management that squashes creativity? And what I found was that many people in the business world were, unbeknownst to me as a literary critic, also very interested in this. So I learned the history of it. I learned about theory X and theory Y coming out of the 1960s, you know, Douglas McGregor's classic. And all of the empirical studies that show that theory X, which is control, is less effective in terms of producing economic outputs, to say nothing of cultural and, and human ones, uh, less effective than theory Y, which is about this more bottom-up, more egalitarian, what you might say, even say more democratic form of organization. Okay. So, I th oddly enough, the you know, companies are pretty top-down. I mean, we Americans think that we are passionate advocates of, de of democratic organization. You would not know that by looking at our corporations. They're not, they're the opposite of democracies. Universities are actually closer to businesses than I would like and than I think is optimal. You know, that we have yeah. separation between students, faculty, staff who are themselves separated, that administration communication is not good. A lot of what's happening on the bottom is not being transmitted up. So I guess the the thing I liked about management theory is that the best ideas that came out of business were at, would actually have improved university management were we ever to implement them. See, that's such a, that's such a <laughs> great point. And, it's, and, and for a lot of, uh, I think, humanities academics, it's almost a counterintuitive one. Yeah. Because the assumption is that we're becoming far more governed uh, by mm -hmm. managerial constraints, mm -hmm. managerial ideas, right, that mm -hmm. excellence is a word that has an increasingly insidious meaning uh, yeah. inside of the humanities. But you point out that actually if uh, the, the, the picture is more nuanced than that, a bit subtler. Well, I, don't, I think it's unnuanced on the other side, which is that uh, so much of management now is around numbers and, and finance. So much of what I did in the Senate was to try to get my own my colleagues to have confidence in the idea that we could have academic programs driving the budget rather than the other way around. First, let's figure out what we're trying to do, then let's figure out how to pay for it. And don't assume from the beginning that we can't really pay for it. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I were talking about Jerry Brown at lunch. State government is now completely about, here's the deficit, this is a given, this is, a, this is really like you know, the Ten Commandments. It's that unchangeable. Yeah. And so we just have to 
cut and trim and downsize and squash everything, including our own imaginations, in order to fit into that. <laughs> and my fear is that many university administrators are in, either intimidated by or impressed by or both the financial management side that was recessive or was on the defensive in the 90s, but which in the, th in the aughts or whatever we're calling that decade, it became much more dominant. Okay, this actually is a, a good segue to the book you wrote published after Ivy and Industry, uh, 2008's book, Unmaking the Public University. If that first book really was looking to tell a kind of a subtle story about a relationship between universities and things outside of them, that second book tells a, really it's a grimmer story about what happened to higher education, really in the 1990s, aughts, et cetera. Um, and you talk about the sort of the culture wars and culture warriors. Yeah. What were you getting at uh, with, with uh, those categories? What are they? Well, there were, they started as the canon wars in academia. There are other right. dimensions of it, yeah. the abortion wars that are still going on as a perfect example, or gay marriage is another well-known example in the sort of larger political context. Um, very, uh, war on affirmative action, for example, race relations was a central issue. Uh, in academia, what we thought were a lot of sort of proxies for these larger struggles that were going on in the wider society about the direction that American life should take, who should be running it, what, and what, what are, you know, the thing that I really focused on, what are all these people coming out of universities going to do? Where, what positions are they going to take? So the, the argument that I make in the book is that we had this great awakening you know, a secular version of the great awakenings we've often had in, in the religious context over the years in, in the U.S. After World War II, and the basic idea was we can't have a cohesive society and we can't have a strong economy unless the whole society is participating on a high level. So the, the two-word summary that, phrase that I used for that idea was mass quality. That is, you wouldn't just have great teaching for elites and the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth tier stuff for everybody else that, you know, they would just kind of shift it as they could and find what they could. You would have, I mean, Berkeley is a good example of this. You would have almost open admissions to a campus where a student would be, you know, taught by a Nobel Prize winner in physics. In other words, the best would be for everybody, not just ration for the top. The, it's expensive to do it that way. Um, but the benefit is, I think this is a virtuous cycle kind of, kind of benefit, is that you then massively accelerate the production of new ideas and of economic affluence and most, most importantly to me, I think really, social ideas, cultural ideas that allow people to live uh, more intelligently and more harmoniously as a result of that. So massive expansion of access to public universities People like my parents, who were the f were first generation college people growing up in Southern California. My father goes to Santa Monica City College and is good at math and somebody takes an interest in him and he ends up going to USC and then to medical school. Unimaginable any, in any previous generation is his family. My mother, um, as I was telling you at lunch, goes to UC Santa Barbara when it's a teacher's college to become a first grade teacher and she's exposed to Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and the world's um, great works of literature and becomes not only tolerant of difference and of other kinds of people and of the wide world in all its ways, she becomes actively interested in and excited by that. So there was a, there was a kind of a, a renaissance period. You know, sometimes we think of it as an economic golden age, but it was really a cultural renaissance when a lot of American problems seemed solvable finally. More money was part of it but also race relations. We could have a civil rights movement without having another civil war. I mean, that's yeah. amazing, given the war that we'd had in the previous century, the years of Jim Crow and so on. So the story that I tell is then how that got <laughs> shut down or how it got contained. You, and the, the argument about the later phase that comes kind of in the 70s, 80s, and 90s is that elites primarily in the U.S. Um, politi in politics and, and economics both became concerned about the majoritarian political power, about the uh, entitlement to a larger share of the economic pie, and also about the cultural diversity, about the, having a multiracial 
uh, middle class that was that felt like it was really the source of economic and cultural value. In other words, that it wasn't coming from just from owner the ownership level, that it was really coming from everybody who was working and everybody who'd increased their productivity with their educational investment. So that has been contained and the, the middle class is much less confident. When I wrote the book, we hadn't had the 2008 crisis yet, but I, I, mean, <laughs> I predicted the crisis, but the, the cultural <laughs> conditions yeah. of submitting to the crisis yeah. of a middle class that had been demoralized by feeling like its opening wasn't respected anymore and its diversity wasn't respected by the, the people who run the society, that lowering of expectations and retreat had already been put in place in the 2000s. So by the time we get the crisis, people are ready to take it on the chin. And book is written to try to help people feel like, oh, we have to get back on our feet and really start the expansive rebuilding vision that we had in those earlier decades. Okay, let me ask you about two aspects of that expansive rebuilding. The first one is about um, a teaching mission. Um, there are, one reads in various public forums, whether it's the New York Times or, or more particular forums sometimes, about how intellectuals have become so specialized, they no longer mm -hmm. communicate with a larger public. Mm -hmm. So one question is, given a larger, more diverse public, how can you administer a curriculum that would allow you to really communicate this effectively without creating, you know, a, again, a sense of a new kind of leftist elite class? How would you have this larger democratic group? So I'm just trying to picture what a leftist elite well, class I'm, would I'm, be. I'm, 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 I, I, look, I'm not a believer in the left. Well, okay, I shouldn't say that. I, let's just say when, that. When, no, no, when I, you yeah, read, you read the kinds of, you know, the kinds of arguments, right, about mm -hmm. a, 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 you know, kind of the, 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 it was the, just about the well educated, about, yeah. you know, the jargon, yeah. Yeah. speaking, uh, mm -hmm. talking about Shakespeare in ways that no one recognized Shakespeare, talking about, you know, sort of Toni Morrison uh, instead of Shakespeare. That's been the real, I think, source of mm -hmm. debate for some. So yeah, how do you how how do you meet a teaching mission, uh, you know, when you're pressed for resources in this new kind of university? How would that happen? Well, one way, and this has been happening, is uh, faculty becoming more self-conscious about teaching methodologies. I, I mean, I don't see teaching and writing for the public to be that different. I see my students as the public, and they are, yeah. and their undergraduates are actually in some ways a pretty good proxy for who you might be talking to on the radio in the sense that they, you know, they're out of high school, but they're not out of college yet. They're, you know, in that mm -hmm. interim sort of phase. And so there's sophistication, et cetera. They had less experience, but. So I, I think about what works with them and what doesn't. You know, I've been teaching, if you count graduate school, for almost 30 years. So I have a fair amount of experience with different size groups and watching eyes glaze over or not, you know, levels of silence or levels of slight distractedness. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, I see it every day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah all, the whole range. Of, yeah. Yeah, so th those kinds of um, use of metaphors, use of direct descriptions, simplified descriptions that then get layered up. I mean, all these things I think are what we do in the classroom and, and translate well to the outside world. What's happened in the last couple of years is I think a, a silver lining in the cloud of online education, which was so mm -hmm. widely talked about a couple of years ago especially in the context of MOOCs, you know, massive yeah. open online courses. One of the, I had real problems with just replacing the sort of face-to-face -face relationship with these massive broadcast courses. It just seemed like 60s TV push model to me. Right. It wasn't, didn't seem very innovative. Sci-fi in the wrong way. Yeah, exactly. But, but that aside, I mean, you know, I think people have come around to seeing the limitations of that now. That aside, it did make me and many people ask the question, well, I'm really, in, you know, enjoying my own brilliance up here with these points that were, you know, really interesting when I wrote the lecture and that I'm now delivering with great enthusiasm. <laughs> but is anything actually getting in? How, what are people learning from this? So the shift to student learning, I think, is going to make us better communicators also. Interesting. Excellent. Um, let me ask you a question. That was kind of a teaching question about, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the challenges faced in the in, the new university. How about the research mission? You know, costs at universities have really, especially research universities, have really escalated. And one of the points you make in your second book is that many uh, federal grants, um, which come in the tens or more millions of dollars, cost universities that much just to sustain. Mm -hmm. 
what is the difference between, or how do universities adjudicate the difference between valuable research from merely costly research? <laughs> well, that's, that's a hard question. Well, we have, this, we have peer review, which helps a lot because people that are in the field really do try to not recommend for funding things that are very expensive, as you point out, but also just not really going to be worth it, either intellectually or in some other way. So that's one thing. I think, I think that process is working fairly decently. The, what is not working is something that you said quickly, but I, which is something I don't think most people know, and that is that what, scientific research loses money. Right. The extramural funds that you're so proud of winning, and it's extremely hard to get these, so we should be proud of the faculty and the staff that actually do get these, then come with indirect costs that the federal government and no state government that I know ever actually pays all of. Right. So the national average is if for every dollar that you bring in in extra mural money you have to use about 20 cents of your own you know BYU money or whatever whatever university it is to add in to the pot. So the solution there is to have a first have transparency about this because it's been really concealed for decades and then secondly find a, a public funding solution that will help universities support important research without going broke. Yes, right. That's a very good suggestion. Um, you know, in, in this book, Unmaking the Public University, is kind of met to kind of a counterpart in a blog that you're curating with Michael Morans called mm -hmm. Remaking the University. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> so we're kind of unmaking to remaking, <laughs> yeah. right, you know. Um, and, and you write blog posts here yourself. You also curate a large amount of material you find that mm -hmm. a lot of academics writing about a lot of subjects. What are some right now, some of the key trends or themes that you notice really taking root? I mean, where is this conversation going? Well, I think uh, the cuts in public funding are now seen as a problem, whereas before they weren't. It just seemed, well, universities are kind of inefficient, so you can take some cuts like the rest of us. And I think folks are now realizing, even my own governor, Jerry Brown, that this has gone too deep and they have to be you know, kind of rolled back. Uh, a second major issue is the one we already talked about is student learning. How are um, universities not only doing a good job of teaching, but actually supporting the whole learning process, which means something that we talk a lot about in the humanities, and that is bringing the person, you know, the subjectivity and the individuality and the identity of the person together with the studying right. process and the teaching process. So that's huge, and that connects to the third issue, which is on, the, on everyone's minds, and that is student debt and student yeah. cost. I mean, the, the debt situation is completely unsustainable. The passing on of this debt from an older, wealthier generation to a poorer, younger one, I think, is immoral. And I, I think more and more people are beginning to realize that the, we just kind of backed into this this system of grants and loans and and constant tuition increases to cover you know shortfalls in research as well as right. student amenities and other things and that we're going to have to do some redesign so the blog is is it's actually um it is it's about remaking in the sense that we try to do kind of researched pieces you know 10 to 1200 words a little bit longer than a lot of a normal posts that say that are pretty honest about what's wrong and that are pretty honest in particular about administrative errors because uh, I find that it's very <laughs> difficult for faculty to talk about this openly. Michael yeah. and I are almost the only people that actually sign our name to our posts. We Is get a right? lot of really interesting posts from people, tenured faculty at other campuses who seem to be afraid of shunning if not actual outright retaliation for right. criticizing their executive vice chancellor and so on. Hmm. So we try to make it a, a site where you can speak openly about sort of difficult issues. And I don't mean necessarily just political controversies, since that's not really our main focus. It's more issues that are difficult because our conventional wisdom is so entrenched in ancient practices. You know, we have ancient ways in the universities that we've been doing things, you know, incremental budgeting or budgetary secrecy or um, uh, various kinds of st stratified information that doesn't circulate to all of the st what we call stakeholders now and so on. And so we're trying to um, change really the, the, the dynamic, the conversational dynamic by um, speaking openly about 
the really the the under not the, the underpinnings more than the underbelly okay. of how the the system works structurally, and then using it as a place for a company offering um, new ideas as well. Okay, um, it's a very good source of information, uh, and so I'd recommend it to our listeners. It's really interesting on what's okay, happening in universities. Um, one last last question. About two minutes left, maybe. Um, the point about human development uh, is a point you make uh, in in both books, really, um, and it's a it's it's seen as a complicated issue. There's the political question, you know, in terms of you know what kind of citizens are you trying to create. Then there are academic historical issues, right? Accounting for diversity, the idea that human that the human being is itself a historical construct. Identities are historical; mm -hmm. they change. They're you know different from place to place around the globe. How can a university, you think, briefly, best uh, account for this kind of ideal in a way that is attentive both to diversity, but also really gives some voice to a strong enough vision of what the human is that it can really achieve this with some kind of force? How can one you know, fashion an idea about development that it can account for diversity also, I guess is my question. Well, I think we do it now with uh, multiple pathways. I mean, sometimes we call them majors. You know, they're different <laughs> disciplines. Right. So completely yeah. different ways of thinking are actually at home in the university. The number of, my, yeah. of really bright literature and culture majors who are completely math phobic is shocking. You know, That's but it, true. But it does signal a, a preference and a, and a way of imagination that we tolerate over here and we encourage over here. And then we encourage another kind of thinking in engineering or somewhere else over there. And we're basically doing both at the same time. In terms of ethnic and, and racial diversity, we're still working on that. There's still um, a long way to go, I think, it, um, certainly on my campus and in, in California, with um, making students feel kind of equally welcome with negotiating cultures that where everybody, you come to a school, you know, as you're Filipino-American, you come to school like Santa Barbara, which is 60% white, which is lower than a lot of people think, but it's still majority white. And you look around and you think, um, all these people have something that I don't have, and I don't know what it is, but I just feel like an outsider here. The feeling like an outsider, feeling unappreciated, feeling, um, I mean, just feeling like you're not central to what is going on impairs performance enormously and prevents society, just from the society's selfish point of view, from optimizing all of the amazing talent that we have. So I think student services are actually a big part of that. Um, more and more sort of awareness on the part of the, the student majority about how their completely unconscious and non-malicious behavior, because it's very rarely actually just racist, affects folks that don't come from what they perceive to be from the inside of the dominant culture. And I guess the last thing I would say is that I mean, I, if I have a universalist element in, in my thinking, because I'm not really so much that, it's um, my belief in human development is something that not only all societies want, but that is you know, passionately desired by every individual. And I just have never seen exceptions to this. If you can find the thing that allows somebody to be imaginative, be productive, be creative, uh, you just amazing things will happen with them. And that's one of the reasons I love, you know, being a professor is I get to see that happening all around me every day. Yeah, excellent. That's a, that's a very good answer. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And thanks for your visit to BYU. We're happy thanks to have you here. Thanks for having me, Matt. I'm yeah, thank you. really glad to be here.